Well, if it wasn't official before, it is now. Crypto? Kinda cringe. When the same people who spent the last decade stinking up your Facebook timeline are now shoehorning buzzword-filled crypto conversations into every interaction they have, it's probably a good sign that the party is over. Or is it just starting? Either way, it's time for you to stop living on the outside of what might end up just being a lame inside joke. So the next time that somebody rudely implies that you might not even understand blockchain, bro, I want you to be armed with not only the knowledge of how one works, but how to create one yourself. That's right, I will teach you how to forge with your own hands to pull from abstract thought into real, executable code, a legit blockchain. Seriously, and we're going to do it in my preferred programming language, Python. But don't worry about trying to code along with this video. I'll put a link to the finished product in the description, which you can then copy and tweak to create your own custom cryptocurrency, however you like. It'll make a lot more sense by the end anyway. Right, so, our own blockchain. Step 1. Every blockchain must have a beginning. A first block, or as it's come to be known, the Genesis block. Genesis as in, the first book of the Old Testament. Not as in, the Sega Genesis, or the band Genesis with or without Phil Collins. Personally, I really like biblical references in my programming because in the beginning, there was nothing until you programmed it like this. Now if you're thinking, whoa, whoa, slow down, egghead, don't sweat it. This is simply a Python data structure, and it might help to put emphasis on the word structure. Try and imagine these brackets as the walls of a three-dimensional figure a block, if you will, because that's what you're looking at, the skeleton of a single block in what will soon become our chain. So what goes inside a block? Well, essentially five things, three of which are easy. Those being the index number of the block, a timestamp, and a list of transactions, like who sent who, how many coins of our currency. The other two pieces are a little more complicated, so we'll come back to them in just a moment. But for now, let's just get them in our block for the sake of completeness. They are the hash of the previous block and the proof. My friends, behold, for these tiny lines of code are the framework of the actual blocks that will house the records of our own cryptocurrency. I've chosen to call mine TrubeCoin because, as it turns out, there's already a Stein coin, and apparently it's already a scam. Which, and this is not a super original or hot take, but a lot of these smaller altcoins as they're known are in fact scams. But who cares, because dude, you've got a block. Let's take a moment to stop and reflect on this achievement. For one, it's a pretty big deal, and two, because making the chain is exponentially more complicated than making the block. And you'll see why I chose to use the word exponentially in just a moment. One of the things that makes the blockchain such an annoyingly big deal is its concept of being immutable, from the Latin immutabilis, meaning unable to change. But why? Why is it unable to change? Well, let's go back to our block skeleton and re-examine the previous hash as promised. Hash comes from cryptographic hashing function. It's also where the crypto and cryptocurrency comes from. And what they are are one-way algorithms that take whatever you put into them and then output a hashed version of that data. It's technically not an encryption because encryption implies that you could decrypt this, but these algorithms are designed to make that as close to impossible as they can. Imagine your hashing algorithm as a wood chipper, and your data is Steve Buscemi in Fargo. To reassemble the actor would be a nearly impossible task. And that was the goal of the NSA when they developed the secure hashing algorithm. Not to chop up Steve Buscemi, but to create a method of obfuscating data that would be powerful enough to use for national security purposes. It also works quite well for cryptocurrency, so that's what we're going to use on our blocks. We'll take all of its contents, the index, the timestamp, the transactions, everything. Roll it all up 
and cram it into the wood chipper. But wait, how does scrambling up our data make our blockchain immutable? It just obscures it. Here's the thing. Our hashing algorithm isn't just creating a bloody mess of snow. It's outputting a very specific string of numbers and letters, a string that needs to stay the same. And much like the 2004 masterpiece The Butterfly Effect, the slightest change to what goes in dramatically changes what comes out. Remember how every block must contain the hash of the previous block? That's because if someone were to go back and try to, let's say, falsify a transaction, the resulting hash would change. It would then no longer match the previous hash on the next block. The chain is destroyed, and Ashton Kutcher is in a wheelchair. But a ruined hash doesn't, like, blow up a blockchain, it just invalidates it. It would quickly become clear that your block is now bogus. So, in other words, you can't change any of the data. In other words, it's immutable. Alright, so that's the hash. It's the sum of all our block's data rolled up and spit out as this unique 64 character string. That leaves us with the proof. So. Our secure hashing algorithm has another purpose, one you might already be somewhat familiar with, and that is the concept of mining. One cannot simply add new blocks to our blockchain without doing some kind of work. And they need to prove that they've done this work by means of a concept called proof of work. You may have heard this described as having to solve a puzzle or a math problem, but it's not really either of those things. What you're actually doing is much more like brute forcing a password, which you can see me do in my video on hacking Wi-Fi. Now, brute force is the art of trying a buttload of combinations until one eventually cracks the code. That is the quote-unquote work that needs to be done in the quote-unquote proof of work. And guess what's really good at doing this kind of work? Graphics cards. That's why they're being price gouged all over the world right now and people are complaining that it's super hard to build a PC. They're all being repurposed en masse for toiling away in the crypto mines. So instead of rendering your Pontiff Knight armor in glorious 4K, your would-be graphics card is running full throttle in some greedy nerd's basement, probably making like, I don't know, $3 a day? Which is great, I mean, who doesn't want to be like, printing money? Because it does work, just remember you have to earn back your initial investment as well as pay taxes on whatever coins you received as regular income based on the value of the coins at the time you received them and then of course don't forget the cost of electricity from leaving the thing running constantly. Not that I'm trying to talk you out of it, I just want to play video games. Anyway, so what is this brute forcing work that seemingly half the world's graphics cards are busy doing right now? Well, quite a bit of it is actually using the same secure hashing algorithm that we use to hash our block's data. And the challenge works like this. We're given the target output value, and then the task is finding what can we put in to get that result. So, as you can imagine, this is pretty hard and takes a pretty long time. But there are ways to regulate this difficulty. In the case of TrubeCoin, I'm going to use sequential zeros to control how hard this work is. So, let's say I want to input something that will give me back a hash that ends in two zeros. So, I'll ask my three-year-old MacBook to start counting from zero and try every single number until one goes in that gives out a hash that ends in two zeros. Not so hard. We can see it only took a couple fractions of a second to solve because we only needed to count to 35. So I need proof of a little bit more difficult work. So I'll ask for a hash that ends in four zeros. Takes a little bit longer and about 100,000 attempts. This is that exponential difficulty I was talking about. And while this example with the zeros is a simplification of the process, the current mining difficulty for Bitcoin is so hard that only about 150 blocks are being mined every day. And you might think, well that's a lot of blocks, but then take into consideration there's an estimated million individuals with mining operations of varying sizes mining at any given time. 
So for Troob Coin, I think a difficulty of about four zeros is enough for now. And if we're able to generate the requested hash, which ends in those four zeros, our blockchain will see that as sufficient proof of work. And that winning number from all our brute force attempts, that solution, that is the proof, the final ingredient to a complete block. So let's review by taking the TrueCoin blockchain for a test drive. I'll send some Troob coins to my friends. I'll give three to Kevin and three to Marcus. I receive a message that these transactions will be stored in the next mined block. I also happen to be a TrueCoin miner, so I'll take care of that myself. I solve the proof of work algorithm by brute forcing an answer, and a new block of TrueCoin is added to the chain. My payments to Kevin and Marcus are recorded, and I receive a TrueCoin reward for my mining efforts. That's all there is to it. A simple but very real, very functioning blockchain. Only place to go from here is to the moon. If you want to see more videos like this, please like and subscribe. I do appreciate you very much, and I hope to see you in the next one.